If you've been enjoying our free The Reason for Everything podcast, please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all platforms or wherever you get your podcasts. But maybe just by way of some some background in terms of how I first got plugged into to you and your work. So years ago, this is like pre-pandemic, I came across your work. A mentor of mine, he's actually based in Australia. He's big in the cannabis and CBD space. And he's like, hey, you got to check out this guy, Colin. See what he's doing doing in the consumer, uh, in the CPG world. And just, you know, follow along. I think he's he's on a cool wave. So follow you on Twitter. And then a funny story, actually, my as I started this podcast a year ago, I was messaging a bunch of people on Twitter, trying to get them on. And the Twitter X transition, they thought I was a bot, the account that I had had for 10, 11, 12 years. So I got suspended, like permanently suspended out of my old account. I was like, what the heck? Yeah. Right as I'm, you know, right as I'm getting started, getting some momentum, I get kicked out of my old account. So I couldn't even go back. I made a, a burner at Arjana's back, uh, has I think 11 followers. I just use it to keep up with some funny stuff and news or whatever. But on that new account, I couldn't even go back and see who I used to follow. So there's a ton of accounts that I'm still rediscovering to this day. About a month ago, I, one, came across your viral reel of quarter zips uh, versus products all over Instagram. Ah, yeah. And then I was like, Land Force, it's not, it's not a, it's a pretty unique <laughs> name. And then I, I started thinking more. And then a, month, a couple of days after that, I got, un, I, I reached out to the head of product at Twitter on LinkedIn. And I said, hey man, here's the situation. Can you just see what you can do? I've gone through the appeals wow. process. He, on, like an hour later, he's like, done, taken care of. I got back. So long-winded way of saying, I've been familiar with your work for a while, had a break for about a year because I got blocked out of my old Twitter account because they thought I was a bot. <laughs> and then serendipitously rediscovered you and your work, now seeing all the golf work that you've done. So for the last year or two, I haven't seen the transition from your traditional work that I saw on Twitter to all things golf now. So that's why I wanted to reach out. I'm a huge golfer. I have a little poster of a gust up there. I don't know if you can see it or not, but if, it, if, uh, if that's in frame, but big golf fan and wanted to just pick your brain and, and hear your perspective on the current landscape of things. And then also learn more about your journey. So long winded preamble way of saying appreciative of your time, excited to jump in. And I'd love to give you a chance to introduce yourself to my audience. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton for having me. I don't talk to that many people that have been around or that have been in my mix since uh, like early Twitter days. So that's always fun. Um, back, back in the good old days of Twitter. Oh yeah. Um, as far, man, I'm, I'm bad at introducing myself. My name's Colin. I'm, I think a serial entrepreneur is like a, a little bit cringe, but I think it's as good as I've found to, uh, to uh, bottle up what I do. I've had one real job. I'm 37. I've had one real job. And besides that, it's just been a little bit of everything. And uh, as you mentioned, I guess it was seven years ago now, um, uh, jumped into the cannabis world. Some guys that I grew up with pre-recreational um, were selling weed. Um, I got a text. It was like, dude, we, we sold a hundred, we sold a hundred thousand dollars this month. And I was like, what the hell? And this was when I was at, at the only job I've ever had. And so I jumped ship, joined them. Um, and then over the next several years, we did a whole string of M&A, did a reverse merger into a public vehicle, did the whole public market thing, got brutalized candidly. And then just over a year ago, uh, bought uh, our original company back from the PubCo. And um, after after been battered and beaten through that whole process. And in the last year, I kind of shifted a bunch of my attention to making video content, uh, particularly around product. And then as you mentioned, it's kind of molded into golf and uh and we've also stabilized that business that i just mentioned and uh it's kind of rolling along and something that we think can be around for another 20 years and got a bunch of other products projects that i didn't mention in between there but that's kind of the the elevator pitch for today's version of it <laughs> beautiful beautiful well we'll uh dive into that a little further let's start with uh, so i was doing my homework saw your linkedin uh header picture was the chamath tweet that just says i'm in the trenches relax <laughs> I, I love Chamath. I love obviously controversial guy. I listen to the all in podcast every week. I loved his tweet last summer about uh, the man in the arena. And I'd love to understand <laughs> why, why that's your uh, LinkedIn header photo. Maybe tee that up for folks a little further. I, 
I feel like that that screenshot is like a collision of my worlds. Uh, it's a Lil Durk lyric. I don't know. I don't know if the the listenership is familiar with Lil Durk, but he's like a uh, a kind of singy song rapper from Chicago, very trap. Um, that's from from a Drake song, and Chamath tweeted it. And like I said, like I'm I'm a rap kid, uh, and then you've got Chamath, who's like this kind of I guess meme at this point of the business world, and worlds collided with that tweet and it's been my header photo uh pretty much everywhere i think for four years now <laughs> that's weird it cracks me yeah. up <laughs> he uh do you listen to the all-in podcast at all yeah from time to time yeah 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 that, that, that's uh that's a good one one of my personal favorites so with that the, the little dirk tweet a uh, little dirk tweet i'm in the trenches relax tremoth quoted i think about that and i talk about that all the time with work of like, hey, like you're in the trenches, the joke, obviously, like you're not actually, you know, in the trenches at war, thankfully, but you're in your Excel spreadsheets or, you know, on Salesforce or doing whatever it is that, you know, modern keyboard warriors do. What are the trenches for you in your day to day, like right now in focusing on video content as you bought the business back and you're, uh, you know, steering the ship in today's day and age? Yeah, I mean, I think my day to day is like, I don't, I'm not sure that I have a concise answer to that right exactly now. It, it's shifting um, and, it, and it varies a lot day to day, honestly. Like my, the first half of my week is very uh, Letterman intensive. Um, uh, that's, when, that's when all of my recurring meetings are, that kind of stuff. And then the back half of the week uh, gets a little bit more flexible, both on that and other stuff and making content and working, working on some other things. Um, but for me, I mean, another, another reason I like that tweet uh, and I guess more so the trenches relate to me is I, I think so many people entrepreneurship like tends to like glorify like delegation and da, 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 and, and, and all that fun stuff. And I've, I haven't ran massive companies, but like at our peak, we were 400 people. And I like, I was completely removed from like doing work. It was just all meetings and, and all that fun stuff. And I've just found that a, I like like I like being in the mix so much more than I like um, being like, I guess in spreadsheets and on meetings and, um, and B uh, that that's where like everything happens. And I think there's so many people that maybe over time get abstracted from the inner workings of actual business. There's also a ton of people that just never actually do it. Right. Um, that, that was an interesting part of my experience with, with the public company and whatnot is like you talk to all these people who are business people who don't act like couldn't actually run a hot dog stand. And, um, I think a big part of my journey has just been realizing like what I actually like doing. And I'm lucky enough to get to do pretty much nothing but that all day, every day. And it's absolutely like in the trenches one way or another, uh, on, on something or, or the other. Now taking a step back in your, your entrepreneurial journey growing up, you know, in Oregon, what was, I mean, going and leaving a, uh, your one and only job to, you know, get into cannabis is, you know, not the typical exit. I imagine that a lot of parents want to hear, but let's start maybe like growing up in, in, in Oregon, you went to Oregon state. What'd you study there? What path did you think you were going to go down growing up as a kid? And when you were in school, I don't think I ever thought about that much. Honestly, do you like, do you have kids? I don't know. Huh? You, I think you about have a kid though, right? Yeah, I have a four-year-old. I think about this a lot now that she's growing up, and my wife and I are responsible for that. But I, I, uh, I didn't think at all about it. I didn't plan at all. I went to school for business because I've been an entrepreneur since I was fourteen or fifteen, and um, uh, that's probably the extent of like the planning or 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 thought that went into it for me. I dropped out with a semester, maybe two semesters left, because um, I was just fed up with it. And, um, I don't have a college degree and I think I, I bring up the parenting thing because I look back a lot at what gave me kind of this like blind confidence. And it was basically just like, un, uh, what is the word? Uh, just unconditional support, right? My parents like never like they weren't like you need to learn the cello and what are your grades like? It was like my like my my construct was basically like remember who you are and who you represent and and do what you say you're gonna do. And besides that, like 
that's all there is. And, and mm-hmm. so I think for me that obviously fostered kind of like, there are no limits, there are no bounds, there are no walls. There's the only expectation is to like generally like be good. Um, and so, like I said, I don't know how we got here. I think about, about that a lot in raising my kid and that was kind of my only actual guiding light. And I haven't particularly planned my life more than a year in advance, like ever. Um, but I have that as my guiding light, if that makes sense. No, it makes a ton of sense. And you mentioned your first entrepreneurial venture when you were what, 13, 14. What, what was that business you, uh, you started running then? God, I mean, there was a uh, high school. So, I mean, my first like serious thing that like made some money and I mean like 16 year old money was, uh, my class in high school got in a lot of trouble for like drinking at dances. And those, so the school shut down our dances. And so I went and like rented venues and threw the parties instead of the school sponsored dances. Like we just went and threw the parties and that was, um, that kind of like I rode that through into college. Right. And then was the cliche DJ in college and whatnot. But that was probably the first thing that like, besides selling weed in high school, that was like an actual business with books and paying taxes and, and that kind of stuff. And it was, it was just classic, like problem solution. It's like, there's not going to be a dance. Cause they, cause they tried to shut us down. It's like, well, we can get a room. We can get speakers like this guy, will DJ, look, we, we have our party back and, and we can like make, make some money on top doing it. Scrappy, 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 scrappy. How about <laughs> <laughs> dropping out of school? What, I mean, you're almost at the end there. What was the first thing you jumped into uh, out of school there? Uh, man, after like, so when I was, my impetus for dropping out was I was taking a, a web programming class. I was learning how to build websites and I, I was basically failing the class cause I wasn't doing the homework assignments and I was instead working on my websites. Um, and it was, it was, I remember the conversation. Like I called my mom and I was like, this is like, this is stupid. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste money. Uh, anymore. My parents paid my tuition, not my rent. So it's, you know, it's like four grand a term or whatever to show up. And so I called him. I was like, we're not doing this anymore. And, uh, I basically went and initially, uh, I was DJing and then working on those sites. And that was a, that was a grind. And I was like super broke for the first like two years of that, if not more. Um, it kind of eventually molded into God, we did like a, a small agency really it was a we did a sms startup before sms was a thing like text marketing was that uh you link yeah jesus wow you're deep that's a deep cut yeah uh that was so that was really like a SaaS, and we didn't know what we were doing so we were selling it like like door-to-door boots on the ground like for a 50 dollar a month thing which doesn't really doesn't pencil but a few months into that it's like well if i'm having this conversation with this business owner I can sell them much higher ticket things than, than this 50 or hundred dollar a month SaaS. And so that molded into, um, uh, marketing agency, a fairly hellish version of a marketing agency. Cause I think agencies can be really good if they stay kind of in a bucket and, uh, uh, niche down and stay consistent. And we were just all over the place. So, um, did that for a while. And that was like the first thing after just like a few years of being broke, um, that I did. And yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then. So you you run it through your all over your we're hell- all over the place. <laughs> no, it's all good. You're running through your hellish marketing agency. Yeah. While this is going on, at what point? At your, what point did your friends reach out to you and say, "Hey, we just did a hundred grand in a month." That was like, so I I, I kind of broke up with my partner there. I was freelancing for a few years. Life was good, and basically, um, got got tired of having like a bunch of clients and just wanted to simplify for a while. So I took a job with one of my clients, um, and in the consumer drone space. So like, like photography, videography drones, that was a good little chapter. Um, just cause we, we launched this product into 2000 best buys worldwide. We traveled all over the world doing, doing the launch events and it was a good little run. Um, and it was, it was as that was kind of coming to an end that cannabis kicked up and this was, like I mentioned before, like this is like pre rec. So I think at this point, like Colorado was recreational. Um, uh, Oregon was medical, which means it's like, we had, you know, we have, we have uh, caretaker cards. Like everybody got all your friends are, are, are getting medical cards. They're assigning you as your caretaker as a group. We had all these cards stacked. So it's like, you got five, you know, I can't remember what it was five per, but if we've got 20 cards, we can have a hundred. 
and it was very, very gray. There were no banks. And uh, I, I think for us, it was always like the, the group was like a group of like product, product guys. And it was like, look, we're, we're just selling flour. And it was like, we, if we have a network of retailers in this immature market that buy flour from us, at some point here, we'll go make products and we'll have 300, 300 shelves to put them on. And that was, that was exactly, that was exactly the roadmap. And, uh, you know, fast forward, like today in the business, we have like nine product lines that we sell on to like three to 350 retailers monthly in the state of Oregon at the peak, right? We did, uh, we did a big merger. We then got acquired da, 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 da. at the peak. We we're, uh, Oregon and California in like a thousand stores. Wow. We had hubs in Portland, Oakland, and, and LA and, manufacturing in Portland and LA and uh, like five or six retail stores. So it's small and simple again. Going from 3D robotics in that business, very, you know, because we're selling into Best Buy, pretty straightforward business to go and launch. Well, not that's, that's, uh, that's not right per se. A, a business that's more easy to go talk to your grandma about than <laughs> jumping into the world of cannabis. What was, I mean, what was, what was your headspace like at that point? Were you worried about, you know, concerns like working around the law? You said it was a gray area. What were you thinking during that time that you were like, from your, a risk profile perspective, you obviously didn't have your kid yet because your kid's only four, but what were you thinking about in terms of, I know you say you don't really think a year ahead. So I'm just trying to put myself into your shoes yeah. when you were making that decision. I mean, so it was, it was weird times in cannabis, but you're in DC, right? I don't know what, it, what it's like there. Right. So like, yeah. It was gray, but it's also like there are dispensaries like all over the place. So, and, and like, I hope my mom doesn't listen to this. Like I've sold weed since I was like 15. So like, you know, th this is like something else. Like we have a warehouse, we have a fleet of vehicles that we're going around doing it in is different, but like, it's, it's been so normal here for so long that it wasn't really particularly on the, uh, it wasn't on my radar. Right. And, yeah. and I think. For me, like looking back, I've had this interesting string of like, in particular, regulated consumer goods, like, like drones and weed. And, uh, my, my dad's business for like 10 years was, was, uh, uh, natural organic cosmetics and skincare, which is FDA regulated. And then I was working on medical devices and I, the, the common thread is like reg regulation and like jumping through hoops and dealing with bullshit. Um, so I think if anything else, it's like weed is just another one of one of those, right? And it's the most stringent of all of those things because you can't do a damn thing without, you basically have dual ERPs, right? You get to use your system to run your business and you have to do it over here in a compliance system too. But besides that, like I'm, I like building things and I've kind of like, I don't second guess anything involved in building things. I just, I just go. I love it. Now I, I worked at a, at a consultancy at a school. We were working for a, large payments processing business. And that was the big question of theirs. And the question they're all scratching their heads with in the boardroom was, Hey, what's going to happen over the next couple of years from uh, in that landscape or any of these, uh, whatever the term is for the bucket of goods that a lot of these ERPs don't want to to run, uh, right. run through or the banking systems want to run through. So you're in this space, this great area. How are you guys? I mean, you said it was a couple of your friends and then obviously it uh, grew out into this larger enterprise. How are you guys going about, you know, building, scaling this business? Obviously, there was a good bit of, um, good bit of activity on the M and A side, and and a lot of complexity there. How are you as an operator staying smart and being prepared for conversations in boardrooms that you didn't necessarily learn in in, uh, in about four years of school? Yeah, I mean, so much of, so our like this business today, which is a derivative of you know what it was when I was it was bigger and whatnot is, is manufacturing and logistics like we make widgets we put widgets on trucks we take them to retailers and so 90 percent of what we do is like it they're widgets it could be anything else right maybe not quite 90 just because the how involved the compliance piece of it is but uh i say that to say like nothing particularly special right mm -hmm. uh it's literally like we're doing assembly we're packaging and we're like they go in master cases, they go into the finished goods area, they load onto trucks. Like it's, it's pretty standard stuff in a lot of ways. It smells better, but um, it, it's not, 
so my whole world is just process and 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 uh systems and managing people business hmm. right now as you guys are are you know back in oh yeah i said back to the helm of the business what's what's to come over the next few years what are you excited about is there a like a dream partnership you could imagine saying hey you'd love for this you know face of the franchise to be endorsing you guys what's maybe that's two folder questions what are you most excited about yeah, yeah, the business yeah. and then potential face of the franchise I'm excited for it to just be little and a good a good business that kicks off a million or two a year is kind of my my hope for it. Um, we it's so different from what it was when we were taking big swings. Like back in the day, the Oregon operation I think peaked at like 1.7 or 1.8 million a month. Were our our summer months, summer being bigger. Um, like again, the Oregon operation that that I I have back today and that was we're doing third party distribution we're moving a ton of bulk flour which is like not quite a commodity but it's pretty close and today it's just much it, it, and all that stuff is very low margin today it is like much smaller dollar volume it's better margins than it's ever been there's still not like margins that you should ever try and do a business with um i i would not ever start another business at like 40 to 50 percent margins but compared to what i've been through with this they're like twice they're like twice of what we ran this business on. So it, it, it works. And, uh, um, you know, our, our months now are like a fraction of what they were back in, back in those days, but they're so much healthier. They're so much simpler and, uh, there's more moving parts in some ways, but, but a lot less in, in the ways that matter, which really just like cash flow at, um, a fraction of the size. And it's just, it's just easy. And I think the, the important part of that business is my partners who are the uh, either founders or very first employees who are also my childhood friends, um, they are the sales team. And they've been working with their customers for six years. And we're basically like creating a platform for them to sell, sell product to their, friend for year, to, to their friends for years and years to come. And... Um, that that's a good place to be, right? Like it's it's an outbound sales business, but three of the four people on our sales team are like own the business, and it's it's pretty locked up. Like it's a good bet. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the right incentive structure to have in in a sales org, definitely. And and then dream collaboration for you guys if you could you know PR tomorrow saying hey this person fully endorsed. And then maybe before that, uh, walk me through the name of the business. LTRMN is that right? Yeah. Is that your know, last names or am I missing a, nope. an act? Uh, man, you're really deep cuts here, man. So Letterman, uh, I used to be in the music industry. Um, and when we were doing that, Letterman was like uh, our Taylor gang, for lack of a better. I told you I was a rap kid, right? That I was just say, our, yeah. our, our crew. And so when this weed thing started happening, it needed a name and that was it. Um, and here we are. It's been... Actually, the other day, I went back through my email and found um, found the email where I was going back with another one of our friends who's a designer who who did the logo and was our creative director for years. And I think it was like 2011. Um, I think I've owned that domain. It's a five letter domain. You can't, can't you can't just go get those these days. No, you cannot. No, yeah. you cannot. All right. So <laughs> Letterman's been around for better half of a, a decade. And I just, I got to know who, who would be the, the dream partnership collab yeah. for Letterman. You know, it, it, so they're from outside the industry. Like that's, that's an obvious place to take it with consumer product, especially in 2024 yeah. in cannabis. It is such a bubble. We do effect. We do zero marketing. Hmm. Our, uh, our marketing, the influencers that matter in that business are the bud tenders. So no one, like there won't ever be anyone, right? It's like our, we talk about our job is to get product on the shelf and then get it off the shelf. And that's like, that's a retail buyer. And that's the bud tender. The bud tenders are our salespeople. And I don't know if you, you consume weed. I don't know if you go to dispensaries ever, but even people that are regular users go into a dispensary and, the, and they ask the bud tender, like, what do you like right now? What do you got? And hmm. those people make decisions for people all day, every day. And that is where all of our attention goes marketing wise. And uh, they're like PR and, you know, like you always see the celebrity endorsements and stuff like this in the headlines, 
and it never in cannabis it never moves the needle um past you know past the the boardroom being excited about about the press cycle uh yeah yeah we keep it simple there isn't one no it makes sense but it's just such a fascinating stark contrast to the alcohol industry and there's obviously so many differences outside of that but yeah in order to succeed in alcohol nowadays you need to have you know whoever as the person on your commercial or on the on the trucks transporting which is and there, obviously there's some there's some uh nuance that there are other brands and bottles that don't necessarily have that with the institutional you know history you know, per se but it's interesting. I think it's I think it's interesting because that has become part of the norm. The brands that just have that don't last very long, and the brands that go and get buy-in from the bartenders and that have retail presences in the the Safeways and the grocery stores and the and, the, and they're still doing like liquor samplings at the liquor store on Friday and Saturday nights, right? And the celebrity face, I think in that in in booze as well as is a nice to have and those little things are the what, what actually moves the needle and gets a brand off the ground yeah spot on I, I would tend to agree there and i'd be curious one of the things i find interesting is you know your newfound focus and appreciation for simplicity of this business in today's state and i'm curious how much of that do you think is the inherent headaches of running a big business and how much of it do you think is your desire for a simple business given You've got a four-year-old at home. You've you've been in the trenches for so long now. What do you think the balance is between between those two? Well, I mean, a big part of where we're at today is that like we've been doing like I figured this whole thing, not I. We figured this out years ago. So like we like iterate on processes and like add things, but like the thing just works. Like we've got good people, like the people that run our business are people that literally started with us rolling pre-rolls campus in industry is interesting because you get all these these great people that just want to be in cannabis and mm -hmm. so like our director of ops has like a biochem degree or something ridiculous and came to us rolling joints and now she she runs the show um but i i think like both where it's at and then where i want it to be is just this function of like we have this thing locked up like now we just need to go cement our brands in like on the shelves and in consumers eyes and we've taken the big swings like we've we've taken these big runs never say never on on anything right but like i have no i just want to have a cash flow machine and honestly there are a lot easier ways to do it than than uh, building brands in cannabis it's brutally competitive but we've we've got this thing it's got momentum and uh yeah, it, it's that. It's just like we've done this before. Literally, that's it. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see Letterman grow over the next however many years you're at the helm and, and past that. Now, shifting to your point on you know starting to make videos about a year ago, like I said, I just over the last call it month or so came across all of the fantastic reels you made, and I'm a huge golf fan. My friends will give me a hard time because I like to get out early in the mornings uh, when we play and when it's warm enough. That's the way to do it. Area. I, that's I, the way to do it. it preaching to the choir here, but I'll, I'll send out the text and whoever jumps on it for the 7 a.m. or 7.30 to beat the heat and beat the the long six-hour round. So we'll, we'll brave the storm for me. But I'd be curious, when in your journey did you know you get interested in into golf? And then at what point did the video creation uh, really start to pique your interest? When I was like 10, my dad was like, you don't have to play golf, but you have to... I opened this up talking about how my parents never required anything of me and he didn't require this of me, but my dad was like, look, if you learn to play golf when you're older and doing business, you are going to be very glad that when you were a kid, you swung a golf club some, and it's, he's never been more right about anything. Um, so I've played golf since I was, I think 10 or 11 or something like that. I played one year in high school. I was, you know, number four on, on the team. Um, and mostly just, smoked weed and, and placed last, um, not last, but I was, I was, I was the last slot on varsity as a senior. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I played for years. I love golf. I had this huge chunk in the middle where I didn't play. I actually, when I was like 19 after high school, I went out to my, like my home course, like on a weekend evening for nine by myself on the back, I shot a 33. And on the 18th green, when that putt went in, 
I, I said, I'm done. Like, like this, like I could tell it was like a fork in the road. Like I'm going to fall off this cliff and just get obsessed and do nothing but golf. And that's not what I want right now. So I went and put my clubs in my trunk and I didn't touch them. I probably touched them three times in the next like five or six years. Um, and, um, and haven't been able to score like that since, but, um, uh, I, I took a, a bunch of time off and then really, unfortunately, right before my daughter was born, started getting back into it. And, uh, that's been years now, but I live five, blo five blocks from a golf course. My favorite thing in the world is like early morning, nine before the office. Um, and with a golf course right there, I can, I can go, go out at six or six thirty, grab a leisurely, you know, multi-ball practice round in like 90 minutes or two hours of I'm really pushing it and be at my desk at eight 30, no problem. And, uh, uh, I love it. And then, you know, like you said, the, the content thing, with cannabis has always been weird, right? Twitter was the only place I could really do it. LinkedIn too. Mm. LinkedIn's a weird, that's a different conversation. But um, I always did Twitter because it was fairly open in that regard. Um, and then I just real, I just like started to realize how much deeper the connection is you can get with people doing video instead of the written word. And you can't do, I mean, you can, you can do some cannabis on Instagram but not really. Um, you can't do it a lick on TikTok. Like not even. Oh, really? Even, I didn't realize that. Even, yeah, you can't even think about it on TikTok. And so, and I've always had this, you know, this insecurity where I didn't want to be the weed guy anyway. Um, so when I started making videos, like I, like my, my interests are much broader than cannabis. They always have been. And I need to, to go beyond that in video. And uh, like I said, I'm a product guy at the end of the day. Like I love consumer product. I love building products. I love everything about it. So my video content um, is that it, like, it's just product stuff, right? And a lot of e-com stuff. And through that process, I'm golfing again more. I'm just like, I make videos about the stuff I nerd out about. So one of those things is like, I'm like looking at golf factories. I want to make some XYZs. I'm like looking at golf factories. I make a video about it and the, I post it and the energy was just different from every other video that I had posted. Yeah. Um, I, I could just tell that there was something there. It was actually when I took it to Instagram, I posted this, the same video on TikTok like weeks before. And then I started Instagram and it was probably my, it was in the first couple of weeks of doing Instagram. So probably my 15th, 20th video, something like that. And it was like, Oh, there's, there's something here. Um, and it, it was literally just a, uh, a, the child of me, like researching factories to make Letterman golf merch. Um, yeah, I started making videos about that and it was like, okay, we can do this. I, I talk a lot about with content, right? The, the, the content you should make is like the intersection. It's a Venn diagram of what you can talk about forever, what people are actually interested in hearing from you and then what you can execute on consistently. And, uh, there are people that could talk longer about golf than I, but there's probably not that many people that talk about golf product longer than I. And I'm a little bit broader than just that. Um, so I, I ran with it and, and now I'm, I'm working on some product in the background, um, that is golf tangential and in the coming weeks here, it's going to shift more around like, uh, building in public and showing that process, not just, not just manufacturers and yada, yada, but, uh, yeah, man. The, the, for me, it's really like the power of building connections with people at scale and building audience. And I, I'm not huge by any means on the internet, but I have something I can do anything I want to with. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know, we'll see what that is tomorrow, but I can do it. It can be anything. Well, the other thing is cool and, you know, and, and the fashion of, of the podcast you're on now being the reason for everything. It's pretty interesting how, while you were heads down in the trenches of Letterman and all of what the last decade has held for you, during that time, there were other creators shepherding out the old wave of golf. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Titleist FJ guy by nature. I'm looking at my clubs over here. I love the old school golf era. But while you were heads down in the trenches building Letterman and all that that entails and had your clubs on the side, all of these other brands started taking off the kind of cool kids on the block started coming in into golf. 
dress codes started changing, music started being playing on courses. Uh, you know, you you started to see drugs and drinking happen all like all that much more on the course. And then you had all these content creators from the Barstool foreplay guys to the country right. club adjacent guys. That, and now Zyre Golf is uh, this huge account that it is today that a lot of people that don't even golf to follow the account because it's a cultural thing now. Yep. I just found it interesting that while you were heads down diving into Letterman, this part of golf took off and then you kind of fall, not even fell, but you got back into the content creation world on Instagram. And there's this beautiful target addressable market of people interested in golf and golf product that is, you know, multiples larger than it was when you were first getting into the, the content game a couple of years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think for me is a big part of it is, you know, years ago, my dad being like, look, you should learn this. You're going to be glad you did when you're, you're older. The evolution of that was me realizing like, dude, I'm going to play golf when I'm 80. Like at no point am I going to not like be glad that I golf at no point. And so then taking that to, to content and then as well as just like, like extrapolating how I spend my time, it's like I'm, I'm building, I'm with my daughter and my wife or I'm doing golf stuff, right? That's, that's, a, good, that's a good existence for me. And, yeah, I'd say and so. it will mostly be that, you know, I'm 37 for another 50 years, I think. And because it's golf, it will literally be 50 years. Like my friends that play pickup basketball can't say that, you know, they've right. got another 15 years. Um, and, and so I think for me, it's like, this is a good investment, <laughs> right? This is, this is never going to go away. It's a very good mentality to have. And, you know, you always hear about golf being a life sport, but again, it's interesting thinking about how that the t tenure of content in golf is never ending yep. really in our, at least in our lifetimes and, 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 and your daughters and, and the generation after that. And I'd be, I'd be curious to that end. One of the top of mind things, one of the videos you posted the other day is about what's going on in the world of uh big cat tiger woods. And yeah. you know, he, his Nike contract obviously expired. He got invited to the, the launch event. What's this, this will probably air in like a month or so. So, um, we'll just be curious your perspective on current state of play with tiger. And I have a couple other kind of questions in that realm. I, so I, I think it's funny. The initial reaction to like the logo for Sunday red is a lot of people dislike it. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you saw the video I did about this, but I, I don't love it, but there are, there are some logos that are obvious that people like, and there are some that are less obvious that, that you can tell are going to be iconic. Um, and I think that the, the Sunday red tiger mark and whatever symbolism makes it up is one of those, like, I'm not in love with it, but I think, I think especially in context of, of apparel and on the course and embroidery and with its simplicity, like, I think it is an I iconic mark that's going to be around for a long time. Um, and obviously tiger wood, tiger woods himself makes that, makes that much more realistic. Um, I'm. I just think brands are how athletes last forever, right? And we're not talking about Greg Norman and Shark. We're not talking about, you know, Shaq and, and his Shaq basketball shoes. Um, I think that Tiger has a different energy and aura about him. I think that doing this with TaylorMade will, will also help that cause. But uh, brands are how, how you last forever. Jordan's obviously the, the peak example of that. But you have have it happening in smaller ways with like LeBron and and uh, and some of these other guys who you know I think no other athlete based brand is going to ever hit what what Jordan's done. But um, I'm excited for all of it. I don't know. There, there's the whole relatability factor with Tiger, which I think was like the crux of it to begin with. It's like it's a bold move to like wear a red shirt on the golf course. Um, so I'm curious to see like how that is is kind of maneuvered and uh uh i think it's interesting they're addressing it head on with the name um but i'm i'm just excited to see what comes like there's only one tiger woods and yep. uh the interesting thing about golf is like his professional career has got got plenty plenty of time left right his his glory days are behind him but like with champions tour like like he's not going anywhere anytime soon no not at all and it'll be interesting to see to your points on, on socials how Charlie impacts this whole situation. And one of the things I find super cool about what Tiger's doing here is in my eyes, at least it's really uh, almost 
genre defining in some ways. To your point, I don't think anything will ever top Nike and Jordan in that deal, but almost in a similar fashion to how Messi had his deal with the MLS. If you're familiar with that, how he got, yeah. you know, right. He got a portion of the team uh, of the team's earnings. I think rights to buy another team or something to that effect, similar to Beckham's with this. I don't new, think, I don't think uh, anybody appreciates how big of a deal that is. Like, not I, a, I don't not know soccer super well, but like that, that deal is like a turning point in, in the future of soccer. Uh, because of like what it's going to do for soccer in America. And it's going to take like five years, but that it's a huge deal, I think. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, to all of sport in general, the fact yeah. that athletes have the, you know, blueprint now in terms of, Hey, I don't want to go and just have a shoe from uh, a signature shoe from Nike. Now I want to go and own a portion of the team or, or whatever it is. I think it's the same vein of, you know, if Tiger goes and builds out this brand with the Taylor May partnership and whatever this manifests out to look like, that's going to be the blueprint for all athletes moving forward. Whenever LeBron's contract expires or whenever, you know, any of the big name athletes contracts expire, if they can go out and, you know, strip out their, their brand and likeness from that company. It's gonna be interesting to see. I mean, like I said, I think it's gonna be a very interesting blueprint to see what he and his team put together. Agreed. I'm we'll curious know to know. Go ahead. Go. No, I was just saying we'll know soon. We will two indeed. Mon- we will. Mondays from now, the 12th. Where, uh, are you, you're going to the event. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you excited yeah. for that? What do you know? Do you, is there a dress code? I, I would be, I'd be I freaking know. out about that. I don't know anything about, I, I know the address, which is like, uh, has to stay private. I don't, that's all yeah, I know right. about it though. Um, are you, you going to wear Sunday, Sunday, are you gonna wear yeah. Sunday red? <laughs> I will not be wearing a red shirt at all. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be, that'd be why that's a, I mean, that's yeah. That'd be, a, that'd be yeah. a decision. Um, yeah, yeah. Or, right. <laughs> As as we round out here, I'd be curious, what are you most excited about in the world of golf product in twenty four and beyond? There's been there's a lot going on in the in the ecosystem right now there, but what's uh outside of maybe outside of the tiger situation, of course, what are you most excited about? I'm like golf apparel and golf fashion is such an interesting animal because it's such a big part of the sport, but no offense to golfers, but like categorically not the coolest people in the world. Right. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting beats to watch because if like, if you look at the trends in golf now, like jogger pants are happening. Joggers died five years ago in the real world. Right. Yeah. And I say that as someone who still wears some joggers from time to time, because like I'm six, one tall athletic build, like joggers are my moment, but it's past. Sorry. Right. Uh, and, and so that, that element is really interesting. I love what Malbin is doing and you got brands like Fantle and, and, uh, these brands that are just not doing skinny pants and not doing really, really trim stuff. Um, because I think there's a a large contingency of golfer where the whole like athletic build stuff doesn't necessarily work for. Um, and it's the, the the skinny pants are like so incredibly dorky in the real world now. I, again, I say this as someone who's not fully removed himself from joggers and and uh, you know tight tapered jeans, but I'm just excited for everything. Uh, I, I think all of the dynamics with the the way that the big brands play into the clubs and 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 all the clubs and and courses do their merch on these other big brands and and how those things collide and. Uh, it's just a really weird, it's a really weird space that's very antiquated in a lot of ways, but changing rapidly in a lot of ways. And who the hell knows what's to come? It, it's cool. It's exciting. It's so cool. It's so dynamic. And it's all, there's also so many pockets in golf culture that as someone who's been in and around it for over a decade now, and I like to think I'm very, you know, aware of what's going on in the world. I was at a, I was playing a golf tournament in August and some guy had thousands of dollars worth of club head, like you know unique one of one club head covers and it's some big brand that I'd, i've never even heard of before i couldn't i don't even know what the name of it is but it, like everyone was freaking out about it it's like oh you had this you know special putter cover they only made 15 and it was there's a whole ebay market i mean right it's just just crazy it's just absolutely crazy and it's so so nerdy and niche but there are people that are buying these things it's crazy yeah i mean and like there's stuff like that and then when you look at like the growth of the game the the demographic right like there's just a lot of money spent in golf like there there's oh, yeah. just so many reasons to put energy into golf 
uh i'm i'm excited about it obviously and i'm also excited my driver is the weak point of of my game. that's that's tough to say there's a lot of weak points but uh <laughs> i i got a new driver a year ago and i have not been able to make it work and i just got it sitting right in front of me this uh that this, Instagram video this posted 10K the Taylor made, yeah. and uh i'm just i'm just incredibly excited to to see if i can get this thing to work a little bit consistently <laughs> There's a, a little bit of, of daylight left out in uh, out in Portland right, right now, so I'll let you go and hopefully get some <laughs> swings in. But uh, Colin, really appreciative of your time. Where's the best place for people to tap in, get in touch with you and what you're doing, and uh, stay in touch with you? Instagram, Land Force, like Air Force, but land. Beautiful. Colin, appreciate the time. Look forward to doing this again here soon. Thanks for having me, dude.